This is an iPod from 2004. And if you had one of these back in the day, you might notice that this one looks a little bit different. This iPod can stream any song directly from Spotify. It's got all of my playlists. It's got my saved albums and artists. It's got a regularly updated list of new releases. And you can even search the entire Spotify catalog. Check it out. talk about exactly what makes this iPod different from how it was when I got it from my mother-in-law last summer. Hi, Leslie. First and foremost, yeah, this streams music from Spotify. There are no local MP3 files on this device, though there could be if I wanted to. It's now got Wi-Fi built in so it can talk to Spotify. It's got Bluetooth audio so you can connect it to your wireless headphones or speakers. Now, I know this is controversial, but I actually left the headphone jack in doesn't do anything though. I modified the lock switch to act as a power switch, which is arguably a downgrade, but I needed some way to control power without modifying the exterior of this case. I switched to a standard micro USB jack for charging. I put a much bigger battery in, but it also draws a lot more power than it used to, so. I replaced the old monochrome display with a full color screen. I didn't really want to do this. I, I feel like this build would have been even cooler if I could have figured out how to use the original display. But I have to say the Spotify black and green looks pretty badass here. I think my favorite new feature is the haptic feedback. So rather than hearing that iconic clicky sound as you spin your finger around on the click wheel, you now get tiny vibration pulses in your hand signaling to you that you are successfully scrolling. Let's see if you can hear it. For the user interface, I really wanted to preserve as much of the original Apple magic as possible. When I first picked this thing up and, and powered it on a few months ago, I, I was surprised at how hard the nostalgia hit. So I knew that for myself and for my fellow millennials who, who carried one of these around, I had, to, I had to preserve that. I wanted to, to really make it feel like the original iPod. You'll notice that the general menu-based navigation and the now playing screens are pretty damn close to the original. On the other hand, I felt like I had to take advantage of the fact that this iPod now has instant access to bajillions of songs and playlists. So I put in a search screen. In theory, this thing can play any song from the Spotify catalog without me needing to mess with my Spotify account elsewhere. And as a bonus, I've added Spotify's official list of new releases right here on the homepage, because I thought it'd be cool to get a taste of something that was curated by Spotify, but was still very dynamic. I'm assuming they update that at least once a week or so. And so I refresh that list each time the iPod reboots. I think that's it. Now, let's talk about how I got this done. There will be a much more detailed description of all this on my Hackaday IO project page, as well as a link to all my software source on GitHub. You can find access to those in the video description somewhere. For hardware, I want to point out right away that the only piece of the original iPod I'm actually using is the case, which includes the almighty click wheel and the hold switch turned power switch. I really gutted this thing. 
At the heart of everything is the Raspberry Pi Zero W. For the uninitiated, this is a $10 single board computer. It is a full computer capable of everything that your smartphone from like 10 years ago was capable of. Which, if you really think about it, is, is still pretty good, especially for $10. I absolutely love these things. I keep a stash of them under my desk at all times. For the display, I'm using this little tiny TV screen from Adafruit. It ended up being the most expensive part, coming in at like 40 bucks, but it was the only screen I could find that was the same size as this clear window within a millimeter or two. It ended up being a great choice because it came with this classic yellow composite video input, which you might recognize from your old CRT TV. The Raspberry Pi Zero has two little connections here for composite video output. So all I had to do was solder two wires between the Raspberry Pi and the display, and I had a picture. The picture honestly doesn't look very good, but it doesn't have to. All I'm doing is rendering relatively large text on a relatively tiny screen. For power, I'm using a 3.7 volt rechargeable lithium ion battery. These are incredibly common. I got this on Amazon for $7. The iPod, I clearly have to talk about the iPod. This is the click wheel iPod from 2004. I think this is the last one they made with a monochrome display. Everything after this had a color screen. Fortunately, I ended up with a spare. So if you look at the backside of the click wheel here, you'll notice this little flat ribbon cable coming off. This used to connect directly to the iPod's motherboard, but I ended up buying a few of these little breakout boards on Amazon. Uh, so I can access each of the little tiny wires that run through here individually on these little headers that are standard size. Thanks to a random 10 year old Hackaday article, which points to a blog post written by someone named Jason Gar, I was able to figure out exactly what each of these wires are supposed to do. And it turns out they're safe to connect directly to the Raspberry Pi's IO pins. Finding that blog post honestly felt like a miracle. This project would not have been remotely as interesting if I couldn't have gotten the original click wheel to work. And there is nothing out there about these old iPods. So Jason, wherever you are out there, thank you so, so much. What else? I used a battery charge module from Adafruit. It's not this one, but it looks kind of like it. You plug USB into one end and you plug the battery into the other end and it charges. Awesome. $7. Also from Adafruit, I used a 5 volt boost module, which also kind of looks like this, but isn't this. It takes the 3.7 volt output from the battery and boosts it up to 5 volts so I could safely power the Raspberry Pi and the display. 15 bucks. Oh, and the particular boost module that I chose had a handy enable pin that you could use to hook up a kill switch. That's what I ended up wiring to the hold switch on the iPod to control power. Last but not least, I present the humble haptic motor. When you apply a voltage across these wires, this little disc just vibrates like crazy. I mounted one of these inside the case and use it to signal to the user that they're physically scrolling. So the Raspberry Pi sends a very quick burst of energy to the motor each time the user slides their finger approximately eight degrees in either direction. I think that's it for hardware.
let's talk software. As you may or may not know, the Raspberry Pi was primarily designed to run Linux. I installed a version called Raspberry Pi OS Lite. It's a very stripped down operating system. There's no desktop environment or graphical user interface of any kind. It runs great on the Raspberry Pi Zero. Obviously, my software does have a user interface. That's what you're looking at on the iPod screen. I'm using a lightweight window manager called Openbox to host the iPod visuals. Beyond the operating system, this project is powered by three distinct software applications, two of which I wrote from scratch. The first one, the one I didn't write, is called Raz Spotify. This is the application that handles all of the actual audio streaming from Spotify's servers. It is stupid easy to use. You just install it, log in with your Spotify credentials, and your Raspberry Pi will magically show up as a Spotify Connect device on your Spotify account. As soon as you figure out how to get audio out of the Pi, you've got music. The Pi Zero makes it kind of tricky to get audio out, but it was still easy. Raz Spotify automatically starts up right when the Pi boots and just keeps running silently in the background until you power down. It's like magic. Send the maintainers of that project some love on GitHub. The second piece of software powering this project is the ClickWheel Reader. I wrote this application in the C programming language because, in my opinion, that's the best way to get speedy access to the Pi's I.O. pins, which, if you remember, that's where we had connected the ClickWheel. My program receives serial data from the click wheel and parses out important things like finger movements and button presses from that data. Basically, the click wheel sends out packets of 32 bits of data, and each of those bits can either be a zero or a one. Each position in that 32-bit packet has a very specific meaning. For example, if the seventh bit is set to a one, that means that the user is currently pressing down the center button on the iPod. Once the packets have been parsed, the C program sends out a broadcast message to any other applications on the Pi that happen to be listening with all of the relevant data. The user interface, which we'll talk about in just a second, is monitoring these broadcasts. That's how it knows when to move the cursor or select a song. The other thing this C program does is trigger the haptic motor as the user moves their finger around. Using the Pi GPIO library, or as my brain likes to call it, PigPIO, I send out very quick pulses of just a few milliseconds to the Pi's I.O. pin that's connected to the haptic motor. Finally, the last piece of software is the front end. This application renders the iPod UI on screen, fetches all my user data from Spotify, and sends playback commands to their servers. What's really interesting here is that the audio playback is completely decoupled from the controls. So when I hit a button in my application, I send a command to Spotify's servers, which then calls back to the Raz Spotify instance running on my Raspberry Pi. It may seem roundabout, but that's actually kind of how Spotify works under the hood. I wrote the front-end application in Python because A, I know it's well supported by the Pi, and B, I could run everything right here on my MacBook as well. I did at least 90% of my development and debugging on this, which saved me a lot of time. I wrote the UI using a built-in Python library called tkinter or as my brain likes to call it, to Kinter. This was my first time using it, and honestly, it was pretty easy to get going. There are plenty of great resources online. I use the Spotify library to manage communication with Spotify's servers. That's Spotify ending with a P-Y. Authentication was a little tricky, but after I figured that out, I was pretty quickly able to fetch my playlists, browse Spotify's curated content, and send playback commands. So, all three of these applications are configured to just automatically start when the Pi boots up. The boot process takes about 45 seconds, which doesn't feel great, but I think it's a small price to pay, all things considered. Again, please see my Hackaday I.O. and GitHub project pages if you want to see exactly how all this stuff works. And yeah, please send some love to all the open source maintainers. Thank you so much for sticking with me. I had an absolute blast making this. I hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, feel free, encouraged even, to subscribe to my channel. I plan on making as many of these projects as I have time for. One last thing before I go. I feel a little bit weird about making what is essentially a 15 minute advertisement for Spotify. Don't get me wrong, I absolutely love Spotify as a consumer and as a developer. I do not take for granted that they are the only streaming platform, as far as I know, that actually offers an SDK to let people like me build things like this. But it is no secret that Spotify does not compensate artists well. Straight up. 
I will add some links to the video description that should explain what I mean. Especially at a time where many of us are consuming more music than ever while simultaneously artists are making less than ever, I challenge you to really think about what kind of value music adds to your day-to-day -day life. For me personally, I cannot imagine having to exercise or make it through a long day of writing code without having access to music. I just couldn't do it. If the value to you adds up to anything greater than zero, I urge you to buy some music or merch directly from the artists that mean the most to you. Physical copies are wonderful. They're, they're not that heavy, I promise. Anyways, thanks again. Hopefully we'll do this again soon.